It doesn't make any sense. sense. Randy was a mellow, mellow kid. I've never even heard him raise his voice. Something was off about this case. case. Modern sleep science says that you can kill in your sleep. It is real, real, real. This is not sleepwalking. It had a sexual overtone to it, to it. She came in my room. Next thing I remember, I'm covered in blood. It was clear cut. He even admitted I did it. I know it was me, but I don't remember anything that just happened. happened, happened. Emergency. Yeah, there's, you need to send police. Okay, and what's going on there? Someone's been murdered. Okay, someone has been murdered? Okay, in what way? Do you know if they're breathing or they're definitely passed away? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, well, what did you see, sir? You're busy, but... I'm at Haverhill Park. Just send the police. It was me. I'm sorry. Thanks. If you can get anything out of it. One person, male or female? Girlfriend? Take him in the car. Now, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office investigating the death of a woman in suburban West Palm Beach. They found the woman dead and took that man who had called 911 in for questioning. Randy Herman is in jail, charged with the stabbing death of 21-year-old Brooke Preston. We'll keep you updated as we learn anything else in this investigation. Reporting live in... Hold your hands up for me. And I met Randy in the jail. I went out to see him the day that he was arrested. And then I was assigned to handle his case, uh, you know, be the lead counsel from that point on. My first impression was just that he wasn't a very big guy. You can turn around, Randy. I'll be standing there. Just a very meek person physically. He definitely seemed different than, you know, a lot of the people I would represent. What I'm going to do is just going to switch out your clothes, all right? He seemed very well-mannered, very respectful. You know what size you are? Huh? Medium? OK. But something was a little bit off about uh, this case. You know what size jeans you wear? 30, 32, 30. So he committed the crime, but he couldn't remember what happened. And then, of course, there was certainly a lack of motive because of how close, uh, you know, Brooke was with him. And you have another roommate, Brooke's sister, right? Jordan? Does she do? No, nobody knows what happened. We don't even know what happened. That's why we're sitting here trying to trying to get it from you. To me, it seemed like a genuine lack of recollection. Was it an argument? Was it? Okay. What do you remember? Okay. <laughs> yes, Randy does tell the police, "I murdered this person because you're standing over them holding a knife." Okay, say goodbye. Okay. Say goodbye. I don't remember anything. When did when did she look away? Okay. Okay, not a problem. Let me let me ask you. Were you guys room ever romantically involved? No. Okay. But to wake up over someone who you consider your sister stabbed a number of times with a knife in your hand, covered in blood, and not know what happened, 
I could imagine it being a very scary proposition for a guy like Randy. Brooke's smile was gorgeous. It was just the personality. And she was literally just always happy. She was beautiful, inspiring, and going places. She had a sense of drive to be better, and she worked hard. People who knew Brooke in her high school days said Brooke was very much someone who was the life of the party. Brooke was this explosive ball of energy. She was lively. She was bubbly. She was athletic. And, you know, she had a lot of close friends. And she was always cool. We'd all hang out, go swimming. we play games, go bowling. <laughs> it was always having fun. We grew up on Instagram, Snapchat. She was always on Facebook. And Brooke taught me how to use Tinder. That's for real, though, like that. Like, like I was like, Brooke was like, how do I do Tinder? And Brooke was like, nah, let me pick the pictures for you. They were always laughing, playing, having fun. Brooke, Randy, and Jordan, they were like family, brother and sister. They were two of his best friends that he grew up with. Moved down here in Florida with him to start a new life. Officers found 21-year-old Brooke Preston dead on the floor, stabbed multiple times. Meanwhile, he remains behind bars without bond. The question here tonight remains, why? Because even he says he can't remember. Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from an inmate at Palm Beach Oak Lake Detention Center. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. Hello. Hello, how are you? Oh, okay, how are you? Oh, doing all right, you know, I'll be okay. Did you talk to the lawyer? Did he called me, but it still don't make sense. Why, what's the matter? Uh, Why? Well, because they didn't tell me why or what made you do it. I don't even know the email, you know? I know. I just wish I'd know how I did it. I was just confused. I didn't know what was happening. You know, I, that's why I called 911. If I wanted to, I could have ran. But that wasn't what was on my mind. I didn't do this intentionally, and this was a person I cared about. This was a close friend, so, I mean, my mind was just, I was just in shock. And one thing that was definitely clear in kind of discussing it with colleagues is none of us could figure out what happened. I definitely felt that Randy was being truthful with me and that he had profound amnesia for the event. And so then the challenge up front was how to defend him. So we called a psychologist that specializes in trauma, just try to explain why maybe Randy had bad amnesia. I was trying to find out what happened just as much as he was. From the very beginning, I cooperated with Dr. Ewing. I looked high and low why he did what he did. I was truly puzzled, because there didn't seem to be any logical basis for this crime. We went through hours of interviews of him just asking me question after question after question. Basically, what I was looking for was, did he have a mental illness? Do you hear voices, see things, are you paranoid? We went through everything he could think of. Did he have a background of oppression or other abuse? But nothing fits. Nothing made sense. Nothing. And so I focused in on questions that I consider to be neurologically related. Have you ever had a head injury? Have you ever had seizure? 
Sometimes people with seizure disorders can act out violently. But again, his answers were no. I mean, we didn't really know where to go. Uh, he was just as confused as I was. I would have walked away saying, there's nothing. Had I not asked that last question, just as a matter of thoroughness, have you ever sleepwalked? When Dr. Ewing first said sleepwalking, he really, you know, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Sleepwalking to me at the time was, you know, going out to the to the kitchen to get a drink of water. But there's a big jump to stabbing somebody 20 times. As a sleep specialist, and I understand, I've seen, you know, hundreds of cases of sleepwalking. So I know sleepwalking is involuntary. You're not consciously aware of what you're doing. But public ideas about sleepwalking, generally not accurate. Until 1964, the general idea was that sleepwalkers were acting out their dreams. I mean, literally getting up and acting out their dreams. This idea that uh, the sleepwalker is out of bed and has got his arms out like Frankenstein. We still see it if you watch uh, something like The Simpsons. But the reality is sleepwalking is a set of related behaviors that comes out of sleep, most often following partial arousal out of deep sleep. And that usually occurs in a state that's not really awake or sleep. There's no difference between people who sleepwalk at home every night and people who commit sleepwalking violence, known as violent parasomnia. Sleepwalkers are not consciously aware of what they're doing. And these days, it is understood that someone can kill somebody in their sleep under the right circumstances. We're here on Sarazen Drive off of Belvedere Road. Deputies have been out here all day blocking off this street. Deputies tell us they got a 911 call this morning from a man who told them a woman was dead inside her home here on Sarazen. As a bloodstain analyst, one of the things I'm attempting to do is try to figure out where the actual crime happened within the scene. In this case, I'm analyzing and interpreting throughout the residence the bloodstains and the movements of Brooke. And it's incredible sensory overload. The smells, the blood just dripping down the walls. I've been doing this for 21 years. I've probably seen more incidents than any human being should. This was one of the more vicious crime scenes that I had to document. I still admit that this case really bothers me. This was totally violent. Brooke was stabbed 25 times. We know that after she's dead and down, he gets a quilt to, to wrap her. There are psychological experts that say sometimes if a person's known to you, they want to cover them to conceal their face from you, to preserve her dignity. But it might be actually to assist him in dragging her out. People don't realize how heavy a, a deadweight body is. You know, we have a beautiful young woman who was absolutely brutally murdered. I mean, this was a prolonged attack that most likely took a couple of minutes. You think about doing this 25 times. It's a brutal, violent struggle that's taking place. The murder weapon is still in the bathroom, covered in Randy's fingerprints, depressed in the blood. At the time of the crime, nobody else was in the house. It was clear cut. He even admitted that she's been murdered, and I did it. On the face of it, there was not really a viable defense. Can I get you guys anything for water or anything like that? No, OK. OK. Give me one second to just make this phone call, and I'll be right back. 
Mrs. Dark. What? It says homicide. That means somebody killed her. How did she die? I can tell you that for right now, it appears that she was stabbed. Oh my God! <laughs> no! <laughs> I've known Randy since he was like 10. She was a mellow, mellow kid. I've never even heard him raise his voice. I mean, God, the kid was at my house. He has been to pool parties. I mean, he's always quiet. Everybody always liked him. Nice guy. Always a nice guy. That makes sense. It doesn't. It, it doesn't really make doesn't. any sense. Never in a million years. What are you doing? Come here. You can come. You go, boy. Yeah, pictures of Randy. Lots of pictures of Randy, because I like surrounding myself with the kids and family. And that's all the different Randys growing up. I mean, his sister, we're always close. And my mom gets upset once in a while, and Randy'd always make her smile. He was the only one that could make her smile. When Randy was little, I wanted him to do something. I'd just pretend I was crying, and he'd do it just so I didn't cry. And even when he got older enough to know that I was pretending and I was faking, he'd still do it because he didn't want to see me sad. All right, fine, just get that look off your face and I'll do it. Hey, Mom. He's always been very good kid, very supportive, very respectful. He's very kind, friendly. Growing up, we really just rode bikes, hiking, exploring the woods. Push hard. I remember he went down the creek the one time with his friends. And he's like, look at the flowers. Aren't they pretty? And they laughed at him. Men don't do that, you know? You're not supposed to notice flowers. You're supposed to act like a man. But it was from being with me and sister, and we love nature and stuff. But it would bother Randy. I haven't met him, but as a clinical and forensic psychologist, I find the case of Randy Herman is fascinating. This dynamic of Randy growing up with the two women in his life and not experiencing traditional masculinity. And so his relationship with women is really tied up with a lot of emotionality. And there may be something about the present dynamic with Brooke and Jordan that was somewhat emotionally similar to what he had with his mother and his sister. Jordan? Okay. Uh, first off, I'm very sorry, okay? There's nothing I can say that would ever help you at all, but... Um, I just kind of want to start from the beginning. I guess you were out of town? Yeah, I flew out Thursday night. OK. Did you talk to your sister on Friday? Yeah, I talk to her every day. OK. She's my sister, but she's like my best friend, too. Brooke Preston was about two years younger than her older sister, Jordan Preston. But they were always together. Brooke and Jordan were childhood best friends surrounded by really supportive parents. Brooke spent a lot of time on social media. She posted a lot, especially about her family. Brooke was close with her family. And, you know, family that close. They did things together. Okay. It's time to take you down to the Dirty Dungeon so that nobody will ever find you. Once a week or so, Preston's had these family dinners to just hang out and bond with their daughters. With Brooke's strong family relationships, it's not surprising 
that she was well liked by everybody. Between Brooke and Randy, was there ever any issues never. or anything? Never at all. I've never been seen him violent. I don't understand. We've lived together since the day he came down here. Plus, we were really good friends in Pennsylvania since as long as I can remember. Was there ever any sort of relationship between them other than friends? Did it ever seem like he tried to express anything more than that? Not to me. I was just making sure there's not like some underlying weird relationship thing that I'm missing or anything. I think if anybody would. I that. wish there was some explanation. But I know my son. I know that he's not capable of doing something like that. The only possible way he could have done it was sleepwalking where he wasn't conscious. He didn't know what was going on. When he was younger, one night, me and Amanda were up and he had already gone to bed. Then we were in the kitchen and he came out and climbed on the counter. He has that look, like a day's look. And Amanda asked him, what are you doing? He'd just look at you and he wouldn't say anything. He was getting a drink and he gets pancake mix out of the cupboard. <laughs> and by then we realized he was sleepwalking. I'd guide him back to bed and he'd go right with me and he'd lay right down and he was out like a light. When we were younger, we had plastic on the windows to keep the heat in in the winter time. He would get up in the middle of the night sleepwalking and just start scratching at the windows and he would say he was trying to get out. When Randy was around 10, I was working at the bar right next door one night. It was late and I had one customer and I was closing up when Randy rode his bike to the bar. And he just walked up to the bar. He laid his head on it. I asked him, what are you doing out this late? And he turned around and walked back out the door and he got on his bike and rode home. I knew he was sleepwalking because he didn't speak to me. Because it was just across the street, he'd ride to the bar every day. So he was very familiar with the road. He could ride over there with his eyes closed. Sleepwalking is complex. It's more likely to occur in adults who had a history of sleepwalking as a child. Certainly, there are sleepwalkers who seem to do very coordinated, scary things. Something like driving a car. It's often automatic. It's a behavior which is overlearned. Something done dozens, hundreds of times. It's one of these, I did it so many times I could do it in my sleep. story today, a killer's unusual defense of sleepwalking. Randy Herman, now 26, is charged with the first-degree murder in Preston's stabbing death. Herman told him about his sleepwalking history, corroborated by family. Meantime, Randy Herman will remain behind bars at the Palm Beach County Jail. Mr. Walsh told me that he was going to ask for a continuance because he had discovered that there was a legitimate potential defense that he wanted to explore. It was a sleepwalking defense. I was very much taken aback because in all my years, I'd never seen it. When Dr. Ewing first brought up sleepwalking, it seemed logical, but there's really not a defense for that here in Florida. In other states, sleepwalking would seem to kind of fold into diminished capacity, but we don't have a diminished capacity defense here in Florida, so we had to find some way to defend Randy's case. The DSM is like an encyclopedia for psychologists and the DSM recognizes sleepwalking as a uh, mental disease or infirmity. So the DSM became the basis for our case. Things happen, right? Sometimes things happen, Randy. And we just need to figure it out. When the police questioned Randy, he was clearly remorseful about what had happened. <laughs> Please tell me. Please tell me. 
we like to follow our common sense and follow the evidence. And, and this appeared to be simply, you know, an act of rage, an act of hatred, an act of, you know, love or scorn, you know, whatever happened. <laughs> On its face, that's what it appeared to be. But then, you know, you, you just know that what you're going to have to explain is, well, where's the motive? Randy said he had no sexual interest in Brooke Preston and that there was no infatuation between the two of them. Randy, it seems like you, know, you had some feelings for Brooke. You hadn't been boyfriend, girlfriend with her, right? Stop, she's a very serious But when you looked at the dynamic of the three of them, he's a, he's a young man, he wasn't terribly attractive, kind of smaller, a little bit heavier, and living in a home with these two very attractive ladies. The vibe that I got was just like, OK, Randy was in love with Brooke Preston. Maybe he attempted something sexual. And she may have rebuffed him. She may have been cruel about it. You know, some people react violently when they're rebuffed or laughed at. And that's maybe what set him off. I feel like Randy really liked Brooke. I do feel like Brooke liked Randy as well. You know that's in every way. Then Brooke started getting serious with this other guy, I guess. And if Randy started getting feelings for, for Brooke, love kills. Were you ever aware of them maybe having any kind of relationship? Randy? Brooke and Randy? No, no. Brooke has a a guy that she's been with on and off for three or four years, Brian. Brooke was in a really committed and very public relationship at the time. She posted stuff online and talked about it all the time. Her boyfriend gets like a promising job opportunity um, up north. And so they're, they're pretty serious. Brooke had recently disclosed to her mother that her and, and, and this guy were, were the real deal. Is that the guy who's in New York? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're together now. They're very happy talking about getting engaged. In fact, she was only here to pick up her car, to drive back to Buffalo. She's starting a new... <laughs> Are you friendly with Randy, or were you friendly? With I was, yeah, I was, I was friendly with Randy. Okay. I mean, you know, I didn't go out of my way to hang out with him, but any time I was hanging out with Jordan and Brooke, you know, he was always there, so we would always hang out. This is much of a shock to me as it is to everybody else. Randy never, to me, shown anything weird except for Friday night. The day before she was killed, Brooke and Randy had been drinking all day. And that night, Randy exhibited very odd behaviors that made her feel uncomfortable. And she communicated that to her friend, Kyle McGregor. Brooke had sent me the text. She said, please pick me up and take me somewhere. And I said, why? And she said, he's being belligerent and stumbling, pissing me off. Right when she texted me that, I was right around the corner about to turn into the neighborhood. I knocked on the door. He was just stumbling around, uh, you know. Basically, he looked like he was drunk to me. Kyle went to the kitchen to get something to drink and didn't remember seeing where Randy went. And then all of a sudden, Brooke came busting out of the bedroom, very upset, and told Kyle that Randy just was in my bedroom closet naked. She said, Randy was butt ass naked doing this to me. Totally naked. Totally naked. That's what she said. And that, obviously, that freaked her out. I mean, I would be freaked out if there was a naked man in my closet. But she grabbed me by the arm and she said, we got to go, you know, can we leave now? He's freaking me out. Really, really scared her. And it just reeks of some sort of sexual interest. And there's other key pieces of evidence that suggested that this was sexually motivated. For example, he had a pair of fuzzy handcuffs next to his bed as well as the murder weapon, a knife. He claimed that 
women like to be tied down, and they actually enjoyed it when he's done it before. Our theory of the case was that Randy Herman was absolutely in love with Brooke Preston, him being nude in the closet. And some of his behaviors that night, maybe he saw as a way to win her over, to show her how much he loved her. Ultimately, she was not interested. He was sort of in the friend zone. And given that this case had a sexual overtone to it, I just said to myself, this is not sleepwalking. If Randy Herman was in a state of sleepwalking at the time he stabbed uh, the victim, then I believe this is an explanation, an excuse for what he did. I mean, we know that modern brain science says that there are reptilian instincts, certain primitive behaviors that uh, served our predecessors, heat, sleep, hunting, sex, protection, and they were still in there somewhere. When you're awake, all these primitive instincts are inhibited by the part of the brain that developed to stop us from acting out, you know, these behaviors. But when you're sleeping, the part of the brain that controls these primitive behaviors is turned off. So sleepwalkers are acting out of uh, primitive instinct. It's not that the sleepwalker gets up and goes hunting or goes looking for a victim. This person is just a potential danger who is approaching them. And they would not know who that person was. They are reacting to a trigger, something that could cause a brief arousal in your sleep. That could be a sound, touch. They wouldn't stab someone once and say, oh, they're dead. They would just keep going until, at some level, they're satisfied there's no longer a risk in front of them. And it's usually triggered by the victim. And so in the case of Randy and his roommate, we should be asking, on that morning, did he perform those violent behaviors while he was in a state of sleepwalking? When Randy was a little kid, I didn't take him to the doctor for sleepwalking because it's a normal thing. You know, I sleptwalk, my daughter sleptwalked, we grew out of it. I didn't know it was a medical thing. I never heard that. And anyways, you have to pay like a lot of money if you actually want to take him to the doctor for sleepwalking. Growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. It was kind of rough. My mom, she was always working all the time and me and my brother, we're always at babysitters. It was when they were younger that their father and I split up. Growing up, I thought my dad like lived so far away. And then as I got older, I'm like, you know, it was only 40 minutes away, an hour away. But he always said that he it was too far for him to come drive. And he never really tried to take the kids, except for when Amanda got older, like old enough to like clean and, you know, take care of herself. He told her she could come live with him. That hurt Randy's feelings. And Randy just totally devastated, thinking dad didn't love him. Growing up, my father wasn't really in the picture. And we kind of got more and more separate. The weekends together get, get longer and longer apart. Uh, my dad has always drank a lot. Uh, he drank all the time. Before my dad and mom split up, they used to get into pretty big fights. I remember one time my dad was drunk and he locked us outside the house and I ended up peeing my pants. I was only like five, I think. And then finally when he let us in, 
my mom and him got in a huge fight. <laughs> that was a bad argument. He was drinking. Okay. He opened the door and pulled me in by my hair. Ow! He kept pushing your head when you argue, they'll push. And he kept doing that, and I didn't like it, so I turned around and I punched him in the face. Well, then he hit me back. So. Toxic masculinity is a relatively new term. But it's really a term that's describing an old idea. I'm going to the moon! Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Mm -hmm. uh, man talk. And it's a way of exploiting male privilege in a way to create dominance and power. Randy is a small guy living in a situation with two women who are by all accounts, probably in a stronger position than he is. They've got financial security. And I think there is something to be said about the pressures of our current time. That we live in a society where everything is open for public consumption. And so people's envies can be easily stirred because instead of comparing themselves to the two or three kids in their class, they've got like 40,000 on the internet that they're measuring themselves against. And for those that have a history of trauma, neglect, a history of feeling insufficient in some way, they are more vulnerable to being in impacted by those feelings of envy and longing. And they end up driving sometimes some of their behaviors, some of their choices. Now at three, shocking new details in the murder of a 21-year-old woman whose body was found stabbed more than a dozen times inside a West Palm Beach home. Here's the big twist in all of this. A TV station in Pennsylvania now reporting that Randy Herman Sr., the father of the suspected killer, he too was charged with murder, accused of killing his girlfriend in February 2015. Now this case was later dropped against him because he committed suicide. The woman had been murdered and they were looking for uh, my dad. I think there was some kind of argument or fight, and um, he killed her. And then he shot himself. When I found out my father shot and killed his girlfriend at the time, I was definitely conflicted. I mean, obviously, this was a person that wasn't really in my life and part of me felt like I shouldn't really care. But another part of me also felt like, you know, this is still my father. I think that Randy Sr.'s homicide and later suicide must have had a significant impact on Randy Jr. Throughout his life, he has been searching for this loving father, father he can connect with, and it's a father he never really finds. And when he next hears about his father, it's in this devastating, ugly, shameful kind of experience that reflects on him. They have the same name, right? He can't get away from it. And that for a young guy like him who's already struggling with his identity, that would have been quite impactful. My brother had to go and clean out my dad's house. And at the time, I was, I was so upset. I was the one crying, and he had to go in there and clean up the mess from the shooting. So he had to clean up the carpets and the walls. And I think that probably wasn't good for him. It probably did some damage. When I learned that his dad had killed his own girlfriend, I thought they would run with that and as some kind of an explanation for some mental defense. You know, like father, like son. I 
After my father had passed away, I moved back in with my mother, and I was working at a meat processing plant in the headroom. I used an air knife, and my job it was removing meat from a, a jawbone. I just stand in a stationary position and just take meat off a jawbone and put it on a conveyor belt, and that was it. it really, it was a dead end job. I was worried. I think he was struggling with dad's death. I just think it all just got to him. Things just weren't going well. I wasn't really going anywhere. I was just doing the same thing every day. Take meat off a jawbone, put it on a conveyor belt. You know, I just felt kind of stuck. I realized how much I had taken for granted and how many chances I was given. And, you know, I really went into a depressed cycle. Hey, Jordan. And at the time, my close friend, Jordan, she had got a job opportunity in West Palm Beach. She was moving down there, and we'd make jokes about me moving down there with her. The more we talked about me moving down there with them, the more it kind of became serious. Eventually, over time, I thought that, you know, maybe this would be a good idea to get out of this, you know, dead-end cycle that I'm in and to move to West Palm Beach and start fresh and, and get a career and really, you know, help my life get back on the right track. He's got lots of money because he had his father's inheritance. I didn't blame him for wanting to go to Florida. I figured, oh, what are you going to do, you know? It's like he has his reasons. He wanted to go down and make something of himself. He used to always tell me that he was going to make lots of money and buy me a house down there. So he went to West Palm Beach with his friends. Jordan and me and Brooke decided to ultimately look for a house together. We were looking around at different places, and we found the house at Sarah's and Drive. It was a nice three-bedroom house just west of uh, West Palm Beach. That would be the house we would move into. It was exciting. It was positive, you know, it was three young adults moving down. We first met Brooke, Randy, and Jordan. They were always joking around with each other. Me and Randy, we clicked instantly. It clicked even better when we found out that we both just moved to Florida from small little country states. He's a country boy, like he's country. I mean, the dude kept a book knife next to his bed. I don't know how much more country you can get than that. Like, it, like it was there every single day. But we were making good money, we were making good money at the business we were doing, selling internet and cable at Walmart. That's what we did. <laughs> so the day's finally over. And I get my beer. I'm working, we're having a good time. It's obviously a fun environment. It's a, a party lifestyle. Drinking a lot of times, having friends over a lot. And Randy, what? Life of a party. Because when he walks into a room, it's crazy. He just brings this smile and this energy and this everything. I mean, I was surrounded by close friends. We get along great. It was just a good time. Consistent with their generation, Randy and Brooke both seem to be actively engaged in social media and the reward system that one gets in social media, posting, getting recognition. And Randy is posting at 2, 3 in the morning, obviously having um, not slept. We know that sleep is really important for a lot of things, including consolidation of memory, cognition, learning, and mood regulation, affect regulation, emotional regulation. I was reading about Randy's case online, 
And there was a whole bunch of comments about my brother being a monster and he deserves way worse than life in prison. It's upsetting because I know he's not a monster, but it's a small town. Everybody judges everybody. I know my mom was worried about seeing people from around here. It took a toll on her. A stabbing in Florida involved two people from Wyalusing. One is now dead and the other is behind bars. I mean, just knowing the family, it's heartbreaking. It was two years before the trial even started, two very long years. Around Wyalusing, where the Prestons were from, they know who I am. I'm afraid I'm going to run into the father, Mr. Preston, who is a very nice man. And I don't want to. I, you know, what do you say? There's nothing to say. I don't know what to say. But there's two sides to every story. Everybody knew that it was BS from the beginning. You take someone's life like that, I think you should lose yours too. Randy claims he didn't remember what happened at the moment. For a case like this, when the defendant says, I don't remember, my mind immediately goes to, OK, what, what are the facts? What does Randy remember? What led up to this? Randy Herman, Brooke Preston, and her older sister, Jordan Preston, were living together at a single family residence on Sarenson Drive. But Jordan had left for a couple of days to spend some time with her boyfriend in Colorado. Meanwhile, Brooke had made the decision to move to live with her longtime boyfriend up in New York. So she had come to that house to pack up her things and drive north and say goodbye to Randy. Thursday morning, I woke up at 3 and picked her up at the Fort Lauderdale airport. We drove back to the house. I ended up dropping her off. It was still fairly early, so at that time, I had went to the beach. And I was able to catch the sunrise. Later that morning, we decided to go out to the beach. Brooke had spent the whole day at the beach with Randy. They'd been drinking quite a bit at the time. Later that afternoon, they went back to the house where they continued drinking. From then on, I was just heavily intoxicated. Me and Brooke drinking on the back porch was, you know, my last clear memory. Randy continued to drink. That's when Brooke texted Kyle, you know, Randy's acting strange. So we know that Kyle came to the house. And then uh, the naked in the closet event had happened. She was very shaken. Brooke said to Kyle, get me out of here. I can't stay here tonight. I need to stay over at your house. And she did. Waking up the next morning, I was half hungover. I was really dehydrated, thirsty. I went to get some water. And that's when I ran into Brooke. She had come back and was kind of gathering the last of her belongings. And I decided to go back to bed. Meanwhile, Kyle and Brooke go to breakfast. A few minutes later, Randy texted her to see where she is. And she says, hey, we're going to go to breakfast if you want to go. He said no, he was in bed asleep. But he had something for her. I remembered I had a T-shirt I wanted to give to Brooke to take to her boyfriend, Brian Brown. I wanted to give that to Brooke before she left. She said she would stop by as soon as they had breakfast. The next thing I remember is her calling my name. I had sat up in bed. She came in my room. 
I told her where the t-shirt was. She picked up the t-shirt. She was smiling, saying thank you. She came over, gave me a hug, and said goodbye. She shut the door, and I laid back down. We know at 8.49 in the morning, a gentleman in the neighborhood by the name of Mr. Childers walks by the house and claims to have heard screams. So the attack likely occurs somewhere within those 10 minutes. I was able to place Brooke in certain places and positions when she received some of her stab wounds. It began at the end of the hall where the bedrooms were located. It then proceeded down the hallway and into the living room by the fireplace. There was some activity at the fireplace. And then I believe ultimately she was dragged back into the hallway. I can tell you that she was still alive when she was in her final resting position because as she laid in the position that we found her in, she was expirating blood from her nose and her mouth until she finally just succumbed. And then I come to standing over top of her, covered in blood, and I'm holding a knife in my hand. We know that we see Randy get into his car. That's when he leaves and calls 911. 911 emergency. We need to send police. Someone's been murdered. I'm at Haverhill Park. Just send the police. It was me. I'm sorry. She was stabbed 25 times. She had defensive wounds. It was clear from the scene that she had struggled desperately. We know that it's not easy to stab a human body. And then to do it repeatedly when somebody's fighting back, they're resisting and they're screaming and they're scratching and trying to get away. And from what we know about Brooke, she was feisty. When you look at the degree to which she fought back, it, it wasn't over in an instant. His hands were injured pretty badly. Those are all stimuli that would awaken a person who's sleepwalking. That all goes to show that clear intent of, of wanting to kill somebody. Sleepwalkers are well known to have a very high threshold for pain and for arousal. It's very difficult to wake up a sleepwalker. The research we did about the sleepwalking showed there are people that will sleepwalk and walk out of like a second story window, and they're not gonna wake up immediately after they hit the ground, even though they're gonna be injured, right? So the cut to Randy's hand wouldn't have been something that would have necessarily startled him out of his sleepwalking episode nor would of the physical nature of the attack. As a journalist with the Palm Beach Post newspaper, I primarily focus on criminal justice and courts coverage. When I first heard about the Randy Harmon trial, I was speaking directly to another journalist, and it was very much one of those, like, you'll never believe what I'm, you know, covering today, what's happening covering courts for so long and for just being in the news industry, you think you've heard everything. But the sleepwalking defense is just one of those things that doesn't happen a lot. So my immediate thought was like, OK, well, let me go find the documents, see if, you know, this is legit. How many other times has this happened before? There were a couple more famous sleepwalking cases. There was one with a four-year-old boy who the father killed. 
and another one where a man ended up killing his wife. And both of them, they were found not guilty. I do know that sleepwalking's been used in other states as a defense, but this was the first case in Florida. It's a big hurdle to jump when you have a burden to prove that something happened. You're basically telling the jury, yeah, this happened, but it's because, you know, Randy sleepwalks. And when you go back to kind of the empathy that people may feel for Brooke and her family and the situation, that also is another big hurdle to, to jump. Did you talk to the lawyer? Did he tell you how much time I could be looking at? Well, he's not sure. Hopefully, you know, within the next couple of weeks, I'll hear something. No, I don't know. In cases like this, where the evidence is overwhelming, we fully expected that there would be, you know, an attempt to negotiate a resolution that everybody could live with. Most cases obviously end up in a plea bargain. Usually the plea offers are also pretty high. And they mentioned a plea of 50 years, but it was just really too high for us. If you're 20 years old or if you're 60 years old, you'll spend the rest of your life in prison. The defense was unwilling to negotiate it to anything that would be acceptable in light of what had happened. And so we were sort of at an impasse. 50, 50 years, 5-0. Is that what he told you? Yeah, I mean, there's no way, you know, that, what do they have that's evidence of premeditation? You know, it's outrageous. I know. In my eyes, I figure if I take it to trial, there's no way I'm going to get convicted of first degree premeditated murder. If I got second degree murder, I'd probably be facing somewhere around 50 anyway, so why not take my chances at trial? I love you, honey. You know, when I sat down with Randy, at some point in the interview, you know, I said, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, he indicated he had never read the Harry Potter books before. And so he was making his way through the series. And he described parallels in the Harry Potter books. You know, anyone who is sentenced to Azkaban, they're basically forced to relive their life's worst moments. You have Randy standing over Brooke's body both of them covered in blood. And he described his time in prison to be his own Azkaban. I wanted to get him the best lawyer I could. You're talking about thousands of dollars, and there's no way we, we don't have it. We knew we had no choice but to go with the public defender. I trusted Joe Walsh and his investigator. Before the trial, I was nervous, but I was hopeful because I felt that uh, they would see Randy for who he is. Randy Herman's trial was actually my first trial that I ever sat on. I was sitting in the selection of it. They were asking questions, and people are raising their hands saying, hey, I can't be in this. But I ended up making it through the whole process. When you're on a jury, you see stuff that you normally would see on crime shows. And then to see it in real life, it is different. It's not the same. <laughs> TV is going to have actors. This is real life. Dave, however, there's no reasonable doubt. And the person sitting there, you're deciding their fate. You're faced with a grave responsibility. Thank you, gentlemen. And that's a big responsibility. You have their family there, and if you get it wrong, now you might have somebody who's holding you responsible for not letting them go free. Something very unusual was the fact that he did admit it. He knew, the police knew, he did murder her. Just send the police, it was me. I think everyone's heard of sleepwalking, right? But as to murdering somebody, I mean, you always hear about sleepwalking, somebody doing something silly, and then they would just get pushed back to their bedroom and say, OK, go back to sleep. Did he have the intention of killing her? Or did he kill her on accident? That's what we were trying to get at between the two. I remember thinking, I'm just going to keep my mind open and listen to all the facts. I wasn't making a judgment either way. It was for them to give us the facts and let us decide whether or not we believe that it could be sleepwalking. 
There seem to be really three possibilities. One, that Randy's lying. He did this, he remembers everything, and he's lying about it. The second possibility is the possibility posed by his defense, which is that he experienced a parasomnia, and the result of that was that he had no consciousness of what he was doing and has no conscious recollection of having done it. And then, of course, there's the third possibility that he may have done this in an act of rage, triggered by the traumatic experience of rejection. And so he is either dissociated from it or can't allow himself to own what he does actually remember about it. In court, Randy Herman, now 26, is on trial charged with the first degree murder in Preston's stabbing death. Ladies and gentlemen of our jury, I'm now going to turn to the people of the state of Florida to make opening statements. Ms. McRoberts, you may proceed when you're ready. The date, as you know, was March 25th of 2017, where this defendant in the early morning hours ended the life of a young woman who had done nothing to deserve it. Our initial intent is to show to the jury that despite what the psychological experts will say and his history of his potential sleepwalking, Randy had developed an unnatural liking to Brooke. She did rebuff him. She was over him, and she was done with his behavior. It wasn't more complex than that. We knew the state's contention really was to exploit a sexual angle in the case. We know the night before this happened, Randy apparently was in the room naked and uh, in the closet, and that was something that Brooke was not comfortable with. So we just kind of decided to focus on the dynamics of the relationship between Randy and Brooke. Okay, Ms. Preston, uh, are you Brooke's sister? Yes. When Brooke's sister, Jordan, took the stand for the defense, it was kind of a surprise, because normally you don't have the family of the deceased speaking in the defense's case. When did you meet Brandy? I was probably around 15 years old. And was that down here or somewhere else? In Pennsylvania. How did you meet? Uh, through mutual friends. She was very quiet, like she was hurt and afraid. I mean, how could you not be? At this point, you've known Mr. Herman for a few years. Yeah. Have you ever exhibited any sort of romantic or sexual interest in you? No any romantic or sexual interest in your sister, Brooke? No. And living together in the house, you all were pretty close and comfortable with each other. Is that accurate to say? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to publish what is, if I may, what's going in evidence as you may. Defense Exhibit 3. Um, do you recognize this picture? I don't remember it. Okay. So are you in this picture? Yes. Okay. And is it, who's the other person in the picture? Brandy, when you live with the one bathroom, were there times when sometimes you all would have to share the bathroom like this? Maybe someone in the shower, someone brushing their teeth, things like that? Yes. Was that pretty commonplace? Yeah, with courtesy to the other, like knock and ask if you can come in. Absolutely. And were there any incidents where that courtesy wasn't respected? No. The photograph really just showed the dynamics of living in a home, two young women, one young man, one bathroom. It just showed how comfortable they were in different levels of dress. They weren't like, you know, strangers to each other. They were all familiar with each other. And now I'm gonna to turn to Mr. Walsh to call his next witness on behalf of Mr. Herman. I'll call Randy Herman. All right, Mr. Herman, why don't you come forward, sir? 
during a homicide trial, it is very rare for a defendant to take the stand. So when his attorneys announced that he would be testifying, it's definitely one of those turning moments that juries hope for. I wanted the jury to see Randy stand up as you know, small as he is, tiny as he is, walk up to the jury box and testify. My name is Randy Herman Jr. My last name is spelled H-E-R-M-A-N. Thank you. How do you feel this afternoon, Randy? I'm okay. You see this man who looks like he could still be in high school. You look at him in the suit that's too big for him and you're like, okay, this is completely jarring. Because you have other cases where, you know, someone looks like a stereotypical, you know, bad guy. He was a little heavier set at the time of the crime. But he had lost weight. He had a very boyish face, very small. So with that type of defendant, his attorney would want him to get up there and speak to the jury and, and, and sort of pull at the, at the sympathy. You called 911. Did you tell them everything you needed to tell them? Yes, yeah. How do you feel about the fact that Brooke Preston died that morning? Terrible. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. That's all the questions I have. All right, Mr. Scott, cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Me, as a prosecutor, I have to be very careful as to not be too authoritarian, because then it's going to appear as if I'm, you know, beating up on this little boy. But Randy Herman had some difficult questions to answer. You came to South Florida from the state of Pennsylvania because your life was spiraling out of control. Isn't that correct? That's correct. When you came to West Palm Beach from late 2016, through March of 2017, the time of the murder, you were still struggling with addiction, correct? That's correct. Your life was still spiraling out of control? It was. When Randy was in Florida, he would call every couple weeks or so. He said he was happy. He had a good job. He loved it down there. He was doing better for himself. But then I found out later that he was just trying to make it sound good for me and mom because he didn't want to let us down. So without that stabilizing presence of his mother and sister, you know, Randy effectively was, you know, left to his own devices. Four months into my job, I realized I wasn't really making the pay I needed. I was using a lot of my inheritance to kind of supplement my lifestyle. <laughs> so the day's finally over. And I get my beer. I decided to take some time off from work. <laughs> and I got to go back tomorrow. And that's when really my drinking started to pick up. In terms of Randy's personal and professional trajectory, it's a sort of where the train fell off the track, so to speak. And I tended to take it to the next level. I was going out to bars nightly spending ridiculous sums of money, and slowly my inheritance started slipping away. I got to the point where I'm partying all night and sleeping all day. He told me, well, you know, I'm straightening up now, Mom. I'm going to get a job. You know, I'm quit drinking. I'm going to, you know, get a job. OK, that's great. So I let it go. I didn't push it. It got to the point where I wanted to stop and I wanted to quit, but I was kind of in this, just like this cycle where I was starting to get depressed because of my drinking and drug use. But at the same time, I was drinking and using drugs to kind of curb that depression. After you were awake and you were talking to her, she walked out of your room. That's when you stabbed her and killed her, right? I guess, I, I don't recall. In murder cases, like Randy's, experts are very important because of the, the fact that it was an insanity claim. All right, Dr. Ewing, please come forward, sir. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon, Judge. So we hired Dr. Ewing. Dr. Ewing, are you familiar with what's known as the Boncolo criteria? Yes, uh, a psychiatrist named Boncolo had 
done studies and reviews of these sleepwalking cases that eventuated in serious, usually homicidal violence. Dr. Boncolo looked at the characteristics of those cases and he came up with 13 uh, criteria. The focus on the Boncolo was the most important thing because it's the one scientifically studied objective thing that we could get across to the jury that would prove that Randy was sleepwalking. The first criteria is that the attack occurred following an arousal soon after sleep onset. I went back to sleep. Next thing I remember is, you know, I'm standing over top of her, covered in blood, and I'm holding a knife in my hand. She was stabbed over and over again, in the face and the neck and the stomach and the back. They were like family. Hey, Jordan. They were like brother and sister. The victim was not recognized at the time. We know that sleepwalkers don't recognize faces. I don't remember getting dressed. I don't remember grabbing my keys. You know, everything was really hazy. We had a profound amnesia for the event. When we were younger, I remember him getting up in the middle of the night. He has that look, like a day's look. I think he was sleepwalking. The defendant actually called the police. Just send the police, it was me, I'm sorry and reported not only that there had been a homicide, but that he did it. No sexual motive, no financial motive that I could discern. <laughs> Please tell me. Things were going downhill. I would drink, you know, almost nightly to the point of, you know, blacking out. The night before this happened, he had not gotten any sleep stayed up to watch the sunrise. He was a mellow, mellow kid. Never in a million years would think he would be violent, no. We knew that he had been using alcohol, but what we learned was the alcohol actually was something that would put you in a deeper sleep faster so that you would be more apt to sleepwalk and do something like this. No question if he was drinking heavily in the two days leading up to this. It sat with me for a while. I mean, I absolutely believed it. This Boncolo criteria nailed it down right to the T of, of basically what he did, you know, and the defense did a great job of showing that. We on the prosecution side had one important thing we wanted to talk about, and that was the timeline. I want to narrow down my time frame from when she walked in to when he leaves and calls 911. We know that Brooke Preston arrived at the home based on the surveillance video from across the street at approximately 8.35 AM. We know that we see Randy get into his car at approximately 8.57, and he drives away. So based on that time frame, we know that Brooke was in the house for approximately 22 minutes. We knew that he remembered her coming in at approximately 8.35 AM. He said the shirt is over in the drawer. She got the shirt, and they had a brief back and forth discussion that most likely took a couple of minutes. They hugged and she turned to leave. And he said that's the last thing he remembers. We know from a gentleman in the neighborhood who heard screams that the attack takes place approximately 8.49. So sort of using that 22 minutes, we just filtered back and filtered back and filtered back. He only had about five minutes to go back to sleep. So it seemed impossible to me that he fell asleep in five minutes and started sleepwalking. State will call Dr. Wade Myers. But in this case, we need an expert to help us explain to the jury why the facts did not support any type of sleepwalking defense. They supported first-degree murder. 
So you lay in bed and then you fall asleep and then you go into typically stage one, your brain waves show a certain wavelength called alpha waves and then you go uh, into stage two sleep, which is, is a little bit deeper. Dr. Myers basically educated the jury on the different stages of sleep. It's about an hour or two after you go to bed is when you first go into deep sleep. And with regard to the defendant's limited window of time, could that have happened scientifically speaking? He's uh, wide awake minutes before for the crime. And you can't go from wide awake to sleepwalking in, in a matter of minutes. We know that Randy admitted being awake when Brooke got there. He admitted speaking to her, showing her where the shirt was, and giving her the hug. So if there's no minutes left to get to sleep, then he wasn't sleepwalking. Obviously, the state is going to use his statement that he was awake at the time when she arrived at the house. And they could say, well, it would have been unlikely that he had fallen into a deep enough sleep to sleepwalk. Sleepwalking generally occurs in the deeper stages. I don't know if I would agree with that. I see where you're getting at, but it can occur um, in the early stages as well. In other words, not in the first minute or two or 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It could be. That's what I'm saying. And when Randy said that he had this interaction with Brooke, we really didn't even know whether that was something that actually had happened or whether he kind of had dreamed that. It's not clear to me whether he was asleep at that point. It's possible that he could have been awake and then he went back to sleep immediately. Uh, that's the way he recalls it. It's possible, though, that he never awoke. In my experience, it's fairly common for defendants to try and fill in the blanks about what happened. And they often fill in things from just before or just after, or add things that seem reasonable to them. So if Randy Herman is remembering that she arrived and that he told her where the shirt was, then the question is, is this what he actually remembers? Or is this what he thinks makes sense to him? Dreaming that interaction with Brooke would mean that he was still sleeping when the incident happened. And if you believe that Randy was sleepwalking, then certainly you wouldn't believe that he intended to do anything. Then how, how could you put somebody in prison for the rest of their life? Folks, each side has made um, argument on what they believe the facts showed in this case. And as officers of the court, I'm sure that everyone has done that in good faith. However, it is up to our jury to decide what the facts of this case are. Sleepwalking is a very tough pill for a lot of people, I think, to swallow. And it's very tough, I think, to have 12 people agree to that. Folks, in just a few moments, you'll be taken to the jury room by the courtroom deputy for your deliberations. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. And on behalf of both the state of Florida and on behalf of Mr. Herman, I want to thank you for those efforts. By the time that the trial ended, we got back into the deliberation room. We sat down. It was almost just a, a not a sigh of relief, but a sigh of, wow, let's get this information out and start talking about this right now, because we've all been holding it in and we want to let it out. So we started blaring words out. Some of the men jurors were very vocal the minute we went back to the room and were saying things like, well, if that was my daughter, I would have killed him. It seemed like it was split. So then that's when we started going through evidence. So the hunting knife by his bed, something like that is not out of the norm here in Florida. There were toy handcuffs, but we didn't give it any weight. The prosecution was trying to tie it into that he had romantic feelings towards her. And there was the incident where he was in the closet. 
I know that spooked her, but they had been drinking all day. It was a stretch for them to try to say that there was some sexual feeling between Brandy and Brooke. We're five hours into this thing, but there were still a few jurors on the fence about the sleepwalking. We had multiple people saying, how long was it for him to get in this deep sleep? So that's why we went through the timeline of when Randy Herman texted her to the time when she pulled up to the house to the time that we thought she got murdered. By the time I'm waiting in a cell underneath the courthouse, just waiting, just watching the clock until they come up with what the verdict's going to be. Felt like a lifetime. When we get the call from the bailiff, the jury has a verdict. That moment, it really starts. You get the nervous, you get the butterflies. So when the verdict is read, the courtroom is just silent. I'm going to have Mr. Herman please rise to receive our jury's verdict. We, the jury, find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. So say we all, this 8th day of May, 2019, in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, signed jury for first. That timeline that we drew up, and we drew it. We had all the text messages. We had time when she pulled in, when he pulled out. And after that timeline, everyone was on the same page. Wasn't enough time for him to be in this, this deep sleep to cause sleepwalking. All right. Randy Allen Herman Jr., a jury of your peers having found you guilty of first-degree murder, I sent you to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Tears and hugs among the victim's family as the jury found Randy Herman guilty of first-degree murder in the stabbing death of 21-year-old roommate Brooke Preston. Brooke's father, John Preston, after the verdict. There's no winners in this whole situation. Everybody's losers. I feel bad for him, the father, because I know he's grieving. I don't know what to say about Randy, but I'll stand by him till the day I die. Sleepwalking occurs anywhere from 1% to 4%. 1% of for 300 million people, that's still a lot of people. And potentially anyone can be a sleepwalker. There's, a, I think, a growing concern about the impact of sleep disruption. As we move into a society riddled with interrupted sleep, we're going to see more and more of these kinds of problems emerge. You know, I've, since I've been in, in jail, I've tried to sit down numerous times with a pen and piece of paper to, to try to reach out, to try to tell them how sorry I am. But it's just, you know, it's difficult. You can't really write out in words. You can't tell someone you're sorry for, for something like that. It just seems like those words just don't, they're just not enough. You can't say, you say sorry if you make a mistake. This is something far more. So, you know, I've tried to reach out, but I don't know how to quite put that into words. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we don't get to know so much about victims because they are silent now. But the entire Preston family friends, extended family. So many people reacted. It was quite moving. 